Amen. Good morning. You know, when I listen back to the podcast, I notice that I say that same thing every week, and it's the same exact fluctuation of my voice. Good morning. <laughs> listen to those like five in a row, and it's going to drive you nuts. So good morning. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> That'd be a little better, baby. Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you, God. We thank you because of who you are. We thank you because of what you have proclaimed us as, your children. We thank you, Father, that you would love your creation enough that as they turned from you, you sent your only son to die, to shed his blood, to pay for the sin of those who would receive him. I thank you that it is your intent that none be lost, that your patience is so great, hoping that each of your creation would turn to you. Father, we trust you. We trust in your timing. We trust in your love. We trust in even your showing us each step. I pray, Father, that you fill me with your Holy Spirit this morning, as I have already prayed, but I pray this publicly for their sake. I give you my voice. I give you my will, my hands, my feet to be used as a conduit for your Holy Spirit to do what he wants. Because your word says he, do, he does only your will. And that is our desire, is to hear from you, not from me or anybody else, but from you. So we invite your Holy Spirit to permeate ears that will hear, not just here but online, and even those who will be listening to this in the future. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was with the Lord this morning asking him what he would have, and what he wanted. He said to me, just tell them to hold on, to persevere. Persevere in faith. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I really need a little more than that. Because that's what we are doing. That's what we are doing. We are persevering. We are stepping where he says to step. We are moving when he says to move. But God, can you give me a little bit more than that? Because we talked about the warfare that's against us right now. And I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed this to be different. It's like things that were conquered years ago, and, I, and by the way, I'm not talking about sin. I mean, perhaps in, in uh, temptation, but I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about even healings that came about a long time ago, even things that we had gotten past so long ago, even in our faith, especially in our faith, where we're rock solid on this and went through the process of faith and conquering that, now all of a sudden we're getting hit in the same ways we were before. I'm not talking about falling to those, I'm saying what Satan is doing in the temptation of us 
to not believe. And I've noticed that. I've noticed it in my own life. I've noticed it in people that I've talked with. Where, man, I, I, I was talking with a, a gentleman this morning that said, yeah, I'm, I'm battling this pain that I haven't battled in over a year. And it, it's just the weirdest thing, just all of a sudden back. That is to fight our faith. Because what is upon us, literally upon us, is the greatest move of God in history. Now, if you open your word, open the word of God, and you read the history, right, that is in there, and the moves of God in there, and then to quantify that statement, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. To say that this is the greatest move of God ever, ever. I don't know, I, th I think it was pretty remarkable that he wiped out the earth except for eight people. That's pretty remarkable. Or that he freed over a million Jews with the voice of one servant that he used. That's pretty remarkable. Or that he built a global-powered nation through a young man that killed a giant. That's pretty amazing. I mean, when you think about these things that have happened that we go through and we just, we just absorb in the Word of God, and to think that what He is doing now is bigger than that, will literally make that look small. That's hard to imagine. <laughs> in fact, God knows that. That's why He said, don't even try because you can't even imagine what I'm doing. But we imagine anyways. We, we set the parameters that we know because we use the quantifier that it's better than that. And it is. But see, Satan is not happy at all with anybody following God. You know, you know he really is the epitome of selfishness. And, and I know that's, that's, that's probably a light way of saying it. He disgusts me. Because even when he has won something, and God has a little sliver, he wants God's sliver. See, that, that's actually what happened at the Tower of Babel. And I know Alex likes me to call it Babel. So everybody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> when God gave away the nations, which by, by the way, in, in case you're wondering where it says that, turn to, uh, where is it? It is in Deuteronomy 32. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 Verse 8, it says here, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided mankind, talking about the Tower of Babel, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Now, I'm not going to rabbit trail into this. This is a huge study, and really an amazing, amazing thing. I know at some point here, God is going to have me go through a series of this so, so you can have all of, the, um, all of the scripture for this. But what it's talking about there is that God gave the nations their inheritance that they wanted, that they desired according to the sons of God, he gave them. Now, that was seven specific principalities that were on his council. Reference to this is Psalm 82. Again, I'm not gonna go down this rabbit trail now, but I'll give you a couple things. Psalm 82 talks about it. It's where judgment was passed on this group of seven principalities that were under Satan, but they were given dominion over the earth in seven regions. 
And the, the nations were their inheritance. That's what it's talking about here in Deuteronomy 32. It's like, okay, you don't want to believe me? God said, fine, go worship who you want. Now they will be your leaders. And he gave away the nations because of their own desire. Now, it's so wild. I know, I know many of you know this, understand this, have heard this before. But I want you to understand the timing of this. This was about 150 years, only 150 years, actually a little less than that, after the flood. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, you have eight people after the flood that build society, that build the world, that literally produce to fill the earth. So within 150 years, and actually I think it's about 143 years, somewhere around there, but within 150 years, you have enough population that brings God to a point of saying, I'm done. You don't want to worship me, fine, fine, I'm done. I give you to the leadership of the principalities that you desire to worship. And that's what he did. 150 years. I mean, think about it. That is like 10 years after the Civil War in America. 10 years after the Civil War that there being eight people on the earth. And then 140-some years later, we have such anarchy on the earth that they want to build a tower to God. I mean, think about that. So God gave away the nations. Then about 200 years later, roughly, right in there, about 200 years later, God begins to set apart a people for himself. Because that's when Abraham was born. About 200 years after the Tower of Babel. So we're not talking a long time here. But out of that one sliver, God would build a promise that you and I, uh, there's a little bit of a ring in, in the, the thing here, that promise that you and I get to be a part of. Okay? And in, in fact, let's, let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. Now this is a little further after Abraham was born, he lives. This is just after he, he has this, I mean, he, he literally has this army of, a, of servants and everything else. He conquers this, this thing, and he, this is shortly after he gives his tent to Melchizedek. Now keep in mind, this is before the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation did not exist until Abraham. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail either. But Abraham was a powerful person, but he was powerful in faith. He was powerful in giving God his yes. And so God began to set him apart to literally build a nation set aside for himself. And it came to a point, and we know this story, where, where Abraham is, is uh, you know, well beyond the age of having children, and Sarah's wife was barren, and yet God gives him a promise. And it was interesting, you, you, ever, you ever get promises from God that, that are profound and yet ambiguous? Like, like he didn't say to Abraham, you will have a son, and by the way, you're going to mess up and have this other son too, but you're going to have a son, and from these two, you're going to have all these nations under you. No, he didn't say that. In fact, he didn't even say at first that he was going to have a kid. He just said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And when you think about it, I mean, apply that to how we hear promises, because immediately when something doesn't happen fairly quickly with on, in our capability of faith, then, then we're like, okay, did I misunderstand? Wait a second. Okay, you said father of many nations, and okay, maybe that could mean this. 
wait, maybe it's not even people at all. Maybe it's animals. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Maybe I'll have these little toys that I'm the father of these nations. You know, we just start grasping at things that can then make sense to us in the moment because we don't see any evidence of what he promised. That's how it was with Abraham. Let's look, chapter 15, and let's look. We'll just begin at verse 1 with this vision that the Lord had uh, had that he gave at this point Abram it wasn't he, he wasn't even Abraham yet but first one after these things the word of the lord came to Abram in a vision fear not Abram i am your shield your reward shall be very great but Abram said now i want to want to stop here for a second it's easy to read this and not recognize what's going on okay Abram had a vision, but this vision was interactive. Like he spoke back in this vision. The Bible talks about this as being a vision. This was more than that. The, the, there was something very physical going on between him and God here. So in this vision, God said, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven the number the, and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Wow, what an amazing promise. I mean, put yourself in that position. Put yourself in the position of... And I, I'd have to look, but I mean... Abraham here, I believe, I believe here he was like 75 or thereabouts. I, I, I think that's about what he was. But older. <laughs> he was past the normal age of having kids. So was Sarah. She was barren, which we'll, we'll see that a little bit later here. But yet he gets this promise, this amazing promise, not just of kids, but that you will be the father of nations. And, and by the way, look up at the stars. Can you count them? No, you can't count them? Well, that represents all your, all your children. You won't be able to count all your children. How would Abraham even quantify that when he's thinking, oh, Lord, I <laughs> thank you for that. Appreciate that. That's so awesome. But God, I hate to remind you, it starts with one, and I don't even have one. But God didn't say anything. God let it go. He let it fester. He let it stay in that spot. And what did Abraham do? Verse 6, and he believed the Lord and it counted to him as righteousness. He believed. He knew it was God. First of all, that's the key. You have to know it was God. Abraham knew it was God. He knew it because he had a relationship with him. This was not the first time that he had heard God's voice. He knew it. He was intimate with God. So he knew it was him. So it didn't matter how crazy it was what he said. It didn't matter that there was no evidence to it whatsoever. He just believed because he knew God could. He knew God could, and because God said it, he knew God would. Man, isn't that where we're at with ignition? Isn't that where you're at in your life, where God has given you promises? And I'll speak for ignition's sake. God has given us promises that are like the stars in the sky, truly. They make no sense earthly. It doesn't make sense, and... and you know, many people close to us that don't believe remind us of that all the time. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. But we believe. We believe. 
And we step in that belief. And we believe. No evidence, no evidence, we believe. No evidence, still no evidence. We continue believing. We walk in that belief. No evidence, no evidence, no evidence to the left, no evidence to the right. But we believe. We walk in that belief. We walk in that trust. And Satan starts to hit. Yeah, but what about this? Abram... I mean, that's awesome that God gave you that promise and, and believe it. Oh, believe it because he's God and he'll do it. But, but you know what? You got to start with one. So maybe you're supposed to help God out a little bit. Before I jump ahead, because that's really chapter 16, let's, let's keep going here. Verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know what I shall, that I shall possess it? Now, now recognize the promise that the Lord gave him. He didn't just promise him to be the father of nations. He promised him land. He promised him a possession that would last forever. Right? And, and Abram is just like, how, Lord? How? He said to him, and, and, but God said, oh, or, or, but he said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a female goat three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun, now basically what God's saying is, bring me your offering. I'll speak. Bring me your offering. Show me your heart. Show me the will of your heart is to do what I say, and I will come and I will speak. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions." As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. In other words, he was promising him more than just, just offspring. He was promising him an inheritance. He was promising him a land that was set aside. Now, remember, okay, this is only 200 years in since the Tower of Babel. Abraham would have known about the history of that happening. That's not that long. I mean, that's, that's less than what the United States has been here as a government. Right? 200 years. So he would have known that all of the land, all of those things were literally given by God to those principalities as an inheritance. So what an extraordinary, extraordinary promise to say, out of that, I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you your own land to become your own nation, one that is held back for me. And it'll be so big 
that you can't even count them just like the stars. What an extraordinary promise. You know, we think some of the promises God gives us now are pretty huge, and they are. What he's promising his bride, what he has promised ignition has been humongous. And we think, you know, man, alive, how how can we hold on to this? But yet recognize how big this promise was in a world where no land, no land was not controlled by the enemy. No land. Because God had literally given it away. And now God is going to take it back for his nation, for his people. That's the promise. It was even confirmed with God accepting his sacrifice. So Abram believed, and it said it counted unto him as righteousness. In fact, if you go to Hebrews 11, it said he believed more and more each day. So he didn't just like falter in his belief, he grew in his belief. That's where I believe we are as a remnant. That's where I believe ignition is. We grow in our faith. But what happens in that? Satan comes and starts to hit familiar territory. He starts to hit in ways that we're familiar with, that we battled before, that we actually even conquered before, that God conquered in our lives. He starts to hit in these things out of desperation. Think about it. Think about how desperate Satan is. He had the entire world. His seven generals controlled all seven regions of the world. There was not a stitch of land that God had. And then God had Abraham, Abram, this, this man after his own heart, and, and he said, okay, in you, I will carve out a little piece of land for you and for my people. That enraged Satan. I mean, how selfish can he be? He has the world, and yet he wants the one thing that God has, and he can't have it. That's how he feels about ignition. That's how he feels about the remnant. He has the chaos of the world, right? He has people believing in him or believing in this guy. And by the way, if you are a Buddhist, I mean, call it what you like, you're believing opposite of God. You are believing in Satan. There is not... God and then 50 other choices, or 5,000 other choices, or if you're in India, 3 million other choices. There's God, or there's not God. That not God, the, the Bible refers to as Baal. Baal is not a specific person, just so you know, or a, or a specific principality. It is a title. It is a title of not God. When you worship not God, you are worshiping Baal, whether that be Ashtoreth, which is a specific, or whether it be Moloch, which is a specific that we see in the Word. But in all of this, it wasn't enough for Satan. He wanted to get that sliver that God set aside for himself. He is doing that now. He has found a remnant all over the world that believes him, that just believes him, that listens to his prophets, that believes him to say that I am coming and I am carrying out Psalm 82. Now we won't go there, but Psalm 82 is God bringing judgment on those seven principalities. Why? because they did a terrible job. He gave them the nations, but not just here, have this, I don't want them anymore. It's here and I will hold you accountable to steward what I give you. Even the principalities, they are held accountable to what they're given. 
And they failed. They royally failed. Why? Because the one thing they were supposed to do was turn people back to God. Clearly, they're they're not going to do that because they want the worship for themselves. Satan wants the worship for himself. And they failed that, and God passed judgment on them in Psalm 82. And he said, I will take back the nations. That was, what, 3,000 years ago? Uh, Maybe not quite that much. Boy, God takes his time to bring that about, doesn't he? But think about it. How much faith does it require to believe that that's what he's doing right now? Because he has said it. He has told us here at Ignition, he has told his prophets all over the world that that's what he is doing. He is building this remnant to literally take back the world. That is every one of those seven places. Every single one of the seven regions. And he's already started it. What he gave ignition at the beginning was what started this ball rolling of taking it back in the spirit. You know, before you can physically take anything back, you have to legally own it, right? And what is God's legal? Is it going down to the nearest house? Oh, man, I hope not. I hope not. No, that's man's court. God's court is righteous. God's court is where the principalities and all those who would oppose God are forced to listen, are forced to obey. God opened up the courtroom to ignition. And again, I won't go in that. You can listen to other podcasts that, that we've talked about before that go into some of this. But those seven principalities were tried before God. Those seven principalities were stripped of their authority before God, were cast before God. And by the way, the seven under them in each region. This happened... And what did it produce? Chaos. That's what God told us it would produce. This was a few years ago. And what has happened over the last couple of years? Chaos. Chaos. Because when you cut off the head of the serpent, it doesn't just stop moving. It just keeps moving around, slithering around. I'll, I'll never forget, I think I was about five years old. We were living in 29 Palms, and, and it was weird. We, we were, my dad was in the Marine Corps. We were li- living off base for the first time, and we lived in a duplex, and our closest neighbor was probably five or six miles away. It's like our neighbor was five feet away, but then any neighbor beyond that was about five miles away. And they had a young child, and I, I think a baby, and the mother came over, and she was, she was really upset, really screaming that her baby was in the crib, as best as I can remember this, her baby was in the crib, and there was this big rattlesnake in the room. And I remember my dad flushing it out of there. And I remember watching it, because we, we lived basically in the desert, 29 Palms, and I don't even think there were that many. But we're in this desert, and I remember him flushing the snake out and watching it, you know, go around. And my dad, who, who was the tough guy, he was the quintessential Clint Wood. You know, he, he's, he's, which I, I have this now, it's so cool, but he has, he has this Clint Eastwood 44 Magnum. And I think he bought it before I was born. But this 44 Magnum, he goes out there and just right at the head of the thing, boom, blows the head clean off. And then we bury the head. And I was fascinated. I'm watching this snake. And it's just moving around like like it still had its head. It's just moving around. It's just moving around. I'm I'm like, Dad, what what is this? I should have learned a lesson because some 20 years later, he thought it was funny to kill another rattlesnake, throw it in the 
trunk of the car and say, here, Greg, here are the keys. I got a present for you in the back. I had no idea. <laughs> Went and opened it, and here's a snake around in there. Okay. Hey, guess what? After the head is cut off, it still moves. It still works. It might be confused. It might not be able to see where it's going, but it still is alive. That's the same right now with the enemy spirit. That's what's going on. That's why there's the chaos. That's why over here is starting to fight over here, and they're supposed to be on the same side. It's because they have no organization. They have no real form of communication in, in overall structure that they had. By the way, I want to mention this to you because this, this is an extraordinary thought. We've dealt a lot with witches, and we've talked with them, and, and the Lord has told us something that has been confirmed over and over again, and that is the fact that Satan thinks this was his time. He thought this was his time that the Antichrist would rise. He thought that it was this time that he would be able to control and have his his time where he controls literally everything. And, and again, I won't go down that road, but that was his thought process. Well, about a year ago, last July, he learned that that wasn't the case. He learned in the court of nations when the Antichrist spirit was tried, found, and cast. It freaked him out because he's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Literally, he said before God, you promised me a timeline. God's like, I promised you nothing. You know the interesting thing is Satan's such a liar. He can't tell the, the, the principalities and people that follow him and even the witches, he can't tell them the truth because he's already told them so many lies. So literally, he's muted in this. So witches, those who serve Satan, these globalists, these Luciferians, they still believe it's their time. What is the guy's name? Something Schwab, Lucius, or Klaus, Klaus, Klaus Schwab, you know, who wrote the book, The Great Reset. I think Lord talked to us a few weeks ago and he said, God has his own reset coming. I'm telling you, it has surprised them, is surprising them, because they still think this is their time. But as we walk in this, as we walk in these promises that God has given ignition, given his remnant all over the world, we're hit with this doubt. We're hit with this thing that, oh, man, that's just so crazy. That's just so crazy. You know, here's this little voice saying, you know, maybe you're just a little off. Maybe you're a little deceived. This all is so fantastic. I mean, sure, God, God could do it in the Old Testament. He did it with Abraham. He did it with David. And, and, you know, yeah, he did it there. But, you know, those, that book's done. That book's done. God doesn't work like that anymore. Now, now we just believe or don't believe and we go to heaven or don't go to heaven. And, and you know, we just kind of wait for God to come and save us. When the whole time he's saying, aren't you going to believe me? Aren't you just going to believe? When you get distracted to step in a different course, even just a little bit, that comes against what God is trying to have you believe in. And one of the, one of the first things we do is we try to quantify it to the landscape in which we see. How, 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 okay, Donald Trump is going to come back because he never really should have left. It was never, it was stolen from him. He, how in the world, God, is he going to come back? How in the world? 
And how in the world is that going to happen even in the next few months? How in the world? I mean, right now, it's getting worse and worse and worse. So we try to figure out in our minds how to quantify that. Okay, well, I could see A, B, C, D, and E happening. And if those all happen in, and happen in the right order, then I could see that possibly. Oh, man, don't fall into that trap. Believe what he said. Flat out, believe it. You don't have to know how. How he has told his, his remnant bride that her being ready means that she literally rules. Now, rules what? Rules Elkton? <laughs> I really think it's a little more than that. No, it rules the earth, taking back the nation taking back all seven regions and ruling. Is it the bride ruling? No, it's Jesus. It's a bride that is ready for him. A bride that is a clear, clean conduit for him to literally rule through. Why? Romans eleven eleven. It's all to make Israel jealous. It's like, see, here is what I want. This is what I offered you. This is what I offered you. And I'm going to show you what I intended because I still intend it for you, Israel. And that's what he's going to do. Why do you think there are two witnesses during the Great Tribulation? What do you think they're witnesses of? Of Jesus dying on the cross? No. No, they're witnesses of the faith revealed and the faith followed through with of those who would believe him, just like Abraham did. Just like Abraham. He believed every day. But there is a downside to that warfare. If we start to listen to the voices that say, yeah, maybe you got it a little wrong. You know, I know, I know you felt it was confirmed, but, but, you know, I mean, maybe relook at this a little bit because that makes no sense. That's exactly what happened to Abraham. And let's see what happened. Verse, or chapter 16 now Sarah, Abram's wife, had bore him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Now, by the way, you know the story. We're going to read it here, but I, I had to point this out. I found it interesting in the prophecy that God gave Abram. Wasn't that, hey, yeah, you're going to have all these, all these nations under... No, the prophecy was your children are going to be in slavery for 400 years. Now, at the time, he didn't say who with, but God knew, didn't he? And how is it that there was even the authority to do that? It's because of what we're reading right now, because Hagar's mother was Egyptian. And literally, Abram, doing what he did, gave authority for that nation over his true son. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, and may it be that I shall obtain children by her. And so sad, Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. Instead of taking it to the Lord, he listened to logic. Isn't that what we do? Now, we, do, we don't need to go further on in the story. You know, you know what happens. She gets, she gets pregnant, she, and, and the moment she starts to show, enmity grows between her and Sarah. And, and Abram's like, she's your servant. Do whatever you want with her. Kick her out. Do whatever you want. And she did. She kicked her out. A pregnant woman by herself, kicked her out. And God met her under the tree, and he said, hey, 
You know that promise that I gave Abram? It applies here. Your son, Ishmael, he will be the father of many nations as well because his father, Abram, was given that promise. Now, we also know the direction that that took. Was that God's will? No. Was Sarah listening to God's will? No. She was looking at the circumstances, seeing God has prevented me from having children. Nobody has children at 90 years old. Nobody. Nobody. We're clean 30 years into our retirement. Nobody has children now. I don't even know how you're going to do it, Abram, but with you, there's a shot. So why don't you take Hagar? She's my servant. I control her anyways. Go take her and maybe I'll get a child out of this. See, all that is is taking God's promise and manipulating it in a, in a way that we could see it happen and not have to have faith. Faith costs. Faith costs us being able to know. That's, that's why it's without seeing. <laughs> right? And that's what is rewarded. It is the walking without seeing. The knowing without knowing. And when we walk in that, those promises are in Isaac. Those promises, by the way, do you know you are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, wait a second, I'm not Jewish. We only have a few in here that are Jewish. Well, no, the Bible says that he was the father of faith. And all who would believe, it says in Romans and says in Galatians, are his children. So what God is doing, we have to believe simply because he said it. Now, if you don't know he said it, then what you have to work on is your relationship with him because I promise you something. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. Because the spirit that is with, within us will always confirm the spirit that is in a prophet, if it is a prophet of God. If somebody is speaking for the Lord, it is the Holy Spirit speaking through them. So as remnant people, as we have the Holy Spirit in us and we have faith to believe, then our spirit will agree with what is being said and will know faith, guys. It's by faith that we walk. It's by faith that we came here to Elkton. I mean, we were in a house for seven years, and, and not just in a house. God literally sequestering us. No, don't tell people about it. I'll bring people there when I want them there for seven years. Now, to a marketer, which is what my degree was in, that doesn't make sense. Wait a second, Lord, did you mean years or was it supposed to be months? Because that would make more sense to me. No, see, it took time to change paradigms. It took time to build faith. It takes time to build your faith because when God asks you to believe and you say yes, then the very next thing is you being tested. Okay, okay, you believe? Awesome. Now let's test it. Because the testing of faith is what shows if it's real faith or not. But it does something else, too. It builds foundations and roots in that faith that can't be shaken. I, I, so many can share this story, but, but I'll tell you, there is... When God builds the roots of your faith so deep, there is nothing that Satan can do in coming against you to rip out those roots. He might ruffle the feathers. He might sway you to where you're like a, you know, cornstalk that's over because of the wind or whatever. He might knock you about. 
But if those roots are deep, he can't kill it. And it comes back after the storm. Have you ever seen a wheat field that was mowed down and came back after the storm? It's wild. That's, that's how God built his nature, right? That's how he built us. When we believe, and when we believe through the storm, that means through the getting hit, through the pain, all of a sudden now we're having pain that we had not had in years. Going through that pain, moving that pain, not just absorbing it, but literally moving through it. And it could be a physical pain or it can be a pain with people you love that think you're absolutely crazy, that think well, you're not even saved anymore. Now, when you believe and you step in that belief, no matter what, it will be counted unto you as righteousness just like it was with Abraham. And I'll tell you what, his promises are real. And he brings about his timing. It's not by accident that we're now in this building. It's not by accident that we are where we are. God's going to open floodgates here. I'm just hoping we have air conditioning first. Which, by the way, they are coming tomorrow to look at it, so yes. Hopefully by next Sunday we will have air conditioning. But bottom line is God is about to explode it. He's been saying that for a long time. And look at the evidence. Don't look at the evidence to produce a different outcome that is less. But do look at the evidence that God gives that shows his word to be true. Like even the evidence that he gave us a couple of years ago of this chaos coming. If that isn't evidence to you, I, I don't know what is. Because if you remember three years ago, things were pretty good. I mean, everything was a fight on TV and whatever, but, but I mean, the economy was good. You know, we were actually able to fill up our tank without taking out a loan right? I mean, it's good. And in the midst of all that, God said, chaos is coming. Chaos that you won't believe. Well, guess what, guys? I, I, I don't want to be a downer, but it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse. And those of us that are remnant, that puts a big smile on our face because God already said it. God's the one bringing this about. Now, it does not mean it gets worse for us because through all of that, God is still our God. He is the one who provides. Alex was reading a, a verse to me the other day in Psalm, I can't remember which one it was, where it was, say it, where, where it was said, you shall have a feast in famine. That's pretty cool. He didn't say you'll have barely enough to survive in famine. No, he said, I'm going to build and, and produce this table before you in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to give you everything that you need. So don't be afraid that the chaos is about to get worse. Don't be afraid that things are about to get worse. Don't be afraid when fake President Biden comes out and he starts signing these things to take away your guns. Because it's going to happen. I don't think he's going to get very far. Maybe to those first few doors that are going to say, uh, no. <laughs> but they're going to try. Watch what happens when Roe v. Wade is overturned. I, I find it funny because, you know, the court could have put that out already. And... Don't think that it's in, in, in the control of the court or Satan or anybody else. It's in God's control when that's going to be released. Because when it's released, it'll produce chaos. All the things going, I mean, have you guys been hearing about these January 6th things 
the, the, what is it, a hearing or something? What a joke. If you know anything about it, it's such a joke. I was there. I was there. And I, I'm not going to worry about it because I've already said that on camera. I was there. I was there listening to Donald Trump, and, and we were standing listening to him, and the Lord said, now go down to the Capitol. I was there walking down, and, and, and I was there listening to what everybody was saying around me. And it wasn't chance of, let's go take the Capitol. It wasn't chance of, the, you know what it was? We were singing hymns. We were singing hymns. This isn't hearsay. I was there and I heard it and I sang it with my own mouth. That's what we were doing going down there. When we got down there, thankfully, and I'll say this on camera in case they want to hold this against me, thankfully, Alexis and Brooke had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and we were staying in some friend's house that was two blocks away or so from the Capitol. So, okay, well, you know, before, before uh, Pence gives his speech, let, let's, let's run real quick and go to the restroom. We'll just go back to the house because it's only a couple blocks away. We went down there. I don't, I don't care what anybody says. I can tell you what I know and I believed myself. We went down there fully believing that Mike Pence would follow through and would demand this to be investigated and put everything on hold, which was in his power to do. We were fully believing that. We were fully believing that this wasn't going to be taken or stolen. But now what's interesting is you look back and it all makes sense. It all makes sense that Satan was allowed to do that. It all makes sense that those who are directed by Satan, who think this is their time, were allowed and are allowed to do these things. I mean, they're allowed to do this January 6th hearing, and it's a joke. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. Thank goodness it's really got poor ratings. <laughs> But they're allowed to do it. Why? Because when you hang somebody, you got to give them enough rope. If there's not enough rope, they won't hang. And that's what God is doing with those who would oppose him. He's forcing their hand to be revealed. Oh, man, church, don't, don't, for a second, think God is not in control of all this and all this is going to turn around. It is. It's in the works now. It's been in the works for a long time. This is happening. But it's going to come from a supernatural event of whatever God decides to do. Because one thing he said is this will not be for the glory of any person. This will be for his glory. So, so all these things that happen, you know, and, and God's told us many things. I, I was being teased a couple of weeks ago from people who uh, don't care very much for ignition about, you know, us being a cult and all that. No, oh, yeah, they, they said, th th this pastor said, that the Washington Monument's gonna come down. And it hasn't yet, so he's wrong. Okay, maybe just have a little more patience. Because guess what, it is. So is the White House. So is the Capitol. They're gonna come down. And there is gonna be something revealed in the bottom of the Washington Monument. I didn't say a gold Plate. I'm not sure where this person got that. But there is going to be a saying that will show who it was dedicated to. These things are going to happen. Why? Because the Lord said that they are. And he didn't just tell me this. Listen, listen to some other prophets. I remember Mark Taylor being one of the first that I heard. Oh, man, I, I, I think he's talking about the same thing. God must have told him the same thing. 
and others now. Julie Green, listen to her. Same thing with her. Same thing with all these others. Why? Because we're getting close. We're getting close. Now, how do you think these people are going to feel when it actually comes down? Oh, man, I hope they'll believe. That's what I hope. I hope they'll believe and I hope that they'll turn and trust him. Don't let the voices that come at us of disbelief even have an inch in your life. Because if you do, you could turn and you could fall just like any one of them. They were people who were here. They were people who were active here. They were people who loved being here and believed and were all in. And now they hate even though they say we're the ones that hate. I find that interesting. Oh, man, believe. Believe. Don't believe because I said it. Don't believe because Julie Green said it or somebody else said it. Believe because you have your own relationship with Jesus Christ, and the Spirit in you agrees with the Spirit in those prophets. Believe because you know it firsthand to yourself. That's what God offers. He offers it to every one of his children. Lex, come on up. We could trust him for that. I'm always amazed. It never ceases to amaze me how the Holy Spirit works with what he lays on my heart and then what he lays on Greg's heart and we never have a conversation. And it just shows me all the more when the spirit of the Lord is wanting to release a word. Um, he really does. The same spirit works in, um, in all of his people and speaks to all of his people. Um, Greg said something interesting at the beginning that just landed on me so profoundly because the Lord had kind of talked about it earlier in the week when he said that you know, all of the nations were, were given away, and yet the Lord carved out something for himself. And it's, it's interesting how when you look at the world today and how things work, we see the ways of God, the character of God, in his word and in his works, but we also see the character and the ways of the enemy. And it, it, it's, there's been a question posed throughout the media here and there, those that are insightful and searching, which are very few, but that when this nation got completely dominated in the House, Senate, and, you know, the entire administration for, for the, the Democratic side, for the, the liberal left side, you would think that that would make them happy, that that would give them a sense of, hey, we, we, know, we are able to dominate now. And what's interesting about the character of Satan is just like how angry and furious he was when God called out Abraham and called, called out this sliver of a nation for himself, and Satan just freaked out because he wanted all of it in that selfishness. I see that same thing today. You would think that with all the power in the world, that a few dissenters, which, you know, there aren't that many bold voices. I think there's a lot of dissent, but it isn't as bold, and it's rising. But you would think that that would make them happy, or that would make them, you know, not spend all their time on the few dissenters when they have the majority of the power, so they believe. And yet, what's interesting is the more power they have, the more they want. That's the essence of lust. And it's like... If all of you are in agreement, but one, one, Ruth, were to stand against me, all of a sudden now I'm fixed on that one. You see that in the story of Daniel. You see that in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see these, these people that get, that Herod coming against Jesus that, that, that was, um, when he was born, you know, that knowing that, that there was a Messiah. It's like he had all the power and all the authority, but somebody that could possibly dissent he goes after. And it's really an interesting thing. And it really reminds me more and more, do not have a complacent, uh, maybe a stronger word is feckless, um, 
kind of disengaged, God's just not allowing it, but don't have this attitude that if I just pull back and I just kind of do mine, you do yours, you know, we're all going to be fine. That is how we got into the situation we're in. The enemy is not, and I said this to the ladies this morning, he's not satisfied with just his foot in the door, like a foothold. The foothold is the beginning of the prying process to fully enter your house to steal, kill, and destroy. So he is not going to stop until he has every dissenting voice crushed. Now, we know that's not going to happen. But if you think for a moment that these kinds of pressures, these kinds of um, persecutions of silencing your voice or your beliefs or in some way squeezing your life aren't gonna, isn't going to come to your front door. Now, most of us have experienced it in some way or another. But that force of choice of whom you serve it will come to your door. Many of us have already experienced it, but if you haven't directly in your little yard of your life, you will. And we are to know who we are. We've got to know who we are, whose we are, and then to stand firm in that place because it is going to come to a place where you can't hide. You cannot run from the storm. You cannot say, and certainly not an ignition, that I know, I know we're an army rising up, but I'm just chilling over here. An army rising up is an engaged, unified body that moves forward toward, by the way, the enemy. And we've got to do it in fellowship with one another. We are designed to work together. We, we complete our calling as we are in fellowship with one another. That's why the children of Israel were a body coming together. Satan's plan is to isolate, and it's already happening more and more. There might be lightning up on COVID, but there's a new wave of some other either variant or disease that's going to flood on in. And little by little, there's one of the tactics of war is to get you so distracted, whether it be from gas prices, the, the fact that eggs, it's just so bizarre, eggs. It's like daily, they're just going up and up and up. I just remember when they were 61 cents, not that long ago, and I just remember thinking, this is awesome. And I, I mean, I just completely miscalculated my grocery bill and seemed to always. You can get so distracted by these things, but, but that's what Matthew 6 talks about. Don't take any thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll put on. I already know you have need of all these things. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But one of the tactics of war is to wear us down so much because we're just concerned about me, myself, and I, and my getting mine, and having this, and doing that, and pursuing that, that all of a sudden the storm comes, and we're not even standing upon the rock that is our protector, our strong tower, our shelter. Um, and this is why these kinds of words to continue to believe and, and what the Lord had put on me, the name of our, the title of the message, and I don't even know if I told Greg this, was steadfast endurance. Steadfast. There's so many verses in Scripture about being steadfast, being resolute, being anchored in Christ. That is what he needs. And you don't always feel it. Brooke had commented in class, and she said, you know, you don't always feel victorious, right? When, when, you're, when you're just each day just standing firm, you don't always have the good, warm, and fuzzy feel good. Oh, man, this is a victorious day. But you know what? Every day you wait yes to God and no to all the not God. You are victorious. And we've got to remember that. Um, that has been where I have stood in, in a lot of pain and things that I'm dealing with right now, even in my family. And I'm just like, Lord, apart from my feelings and my circumstances, I choose you. I trust you. I trust your ways. I don't understand your ways, but I trust your ways. And he will. Knowledge will come after faith. If you need knowledge before you believe, you're never going to have the knowledge of truth. You'll have some form of knowledge, but when you deny the power with no faith, you will have a twisted form of knowledge, which is what's infected a lot of the bride. So what an incredible um, reminder and such great, great stories in the Word of God that are not just stories. They are given, as Hebrews says, for our example. So thank you. Father, Just, I just want to come before you right now and praise you for your word. Praise you for the rhema word that came from the Logos word, your written word this morning. God, thank you for bringing this download through your servant Greg this morning, God. I just ask, God, that none of your words would fall to the ground 
and be lost on us, that we would take these words and no matter how our bodies feel, maybe feeling stuffy or hot or tired or stomachs beginning to growl, God, that we would set these things aside. You know that we have need of all these things. We will seek you. We will seek first you and your kingdom and your righteousness. Then you will release to us everything that's needed, even things we didn't even know we needed. Thank you, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. As we sang earlier, you are so faithful. And God, there was another line in the song that we sang today, that the resurrection song that said, crucify your hesitation. Oh God, may we crucify our hesitation. May we die to ourself, this place of needing to know the very spirit that attacked Eve when she had everything, but the one thing she couldn't have and didn't know is what she felt she needed to know. Oh God, may that not be our downfall that we have to have a sense of something to feel good within ourselves rather than just this blind place of trust and faith. That is, as Greg said, the walking without the sight, but only by faith. God, I just pray that you would challenge us in the smallest areas to the largest because we know if we don't steward these small areas, the tiniest things, the, the, the seemingly most benign emotions, if we do not steward these things in faith, we will never have the strength to deal with the big issues that come on like a tidal wave at times in our lives. But that little day-by-day day trust in everything, acknowledging you in all of our ways, results in you directing our path. So I pray that over Ignition. I pray that over every listener today, God, online, on the podcasts, God, and as you increase our voice, God, may you, may you always take your word forth into the world. We love you, God. We worship you. We praise you. And I pray that everyone would say with me today that to the best of our ability, we trust you, God. And I know you're refining our trust all the time, but we trust you because you are good, you are a good, good father. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.